Welcome today uh, on Strange Loop Chats. We're talking with uh, Felina Hermans, who is the Associate Professor at the Leiden Institute of Advanced Computer Science at Leiden University. And um, she has previously spoken at Strange Loop twice. Uh, and she did a keynote in 2019. Yeah, 2019. Um, and, but today I wanted to talk um, first with her about her new book, which is called The Programmer's Brain. So I did get uh, the advanced uh, early access version of it. And so I've read the first part of it. Um, and I really love the way that the book is um, organized. Um, so maybe you could just talk about the four parts of the book and give a little overview of the content of it. Yeah, absolutely. So the program of brain is about what happens in your, in your brain when you program. It is basically a very brief introduction into cognitive science, but then really meant for people that are programming. Clearly, all the knowledge about cognitive science, you could learn it from many other general interest books. But my book is really specifically aimed at programming and at people that are doing programming as a job. Okay. So the first part of the book is really about in detail what happens in your brain if you program. And specifically, we zoom in into what happens in your brain if you read code. Because if you read a piece of code that's really hard, then often and you don't really know what to do, right? You read code, maybe it's because you wanna uh, use a library on GitHub. You're like, oh, let's see what the code does. Or maybe it's code you yourself wrote a few months ago. And you look at the code, it's like, oh, what does this do? You're confused and it makes you a bit unhappy because you don't want to be confused. You wanna straight understand what's going on. So then if you understand your own confusion a little bit better, then you can also deal with it a bit better. And then later on in the book, we also talk about specifically about how to write code that is less confusing for other people. And then we also talk about the act of programming. So just sitting down and programming what happens then. And all the way at the end of the book, we also talk about how you as a more senior programmer can deal with the confusion of junior programmers, people that are in your team and are maybe still getting to know the programming language or getting to know the code base, because there's also things you can do to make sure other people are less confused. I really like that it starts with like really practical sorts of problems and then um, sort of gets into the cognitive psychology or the sort of goes a level deeper into the sort of brain parts of it <laughs> and things like that. And it reminds me of uh, a few other books, but like certainly like Thinking Fast and Slow um, is, uh, it reminds me of all sorts of things like that. So um, I, I'm really, uh, it, it, there's a lot of like studies and there's a lot of, uh, you know, actual work it's tying to. It's not just, uh, uh, you know, I think this is how things work. or <laughs> It's actually backed up by a lot of detail. And so um, that's, that's excellent. Um, so let, let me just ask you a, a leading question about the first part of the book, which is all about reading code. How does, how does memory affect how we read and understand code? Yeah, that's a great question because there are already many parts to the answer to that question. So it isn't just memory is memory. There are a few parts to your memory. This is also what we explain, of course, in the book in more detail. Firstly, there's your long-term memory. This is what you have already stored, all the things you know, all the things, for example, you know about Java syntax, but also all the things you know about how Java programs are typically organized. All that is long-term memory. Then there's also, also short-term memory, and that's what you can remember, like the, the first few three or four words that you read will be stored in your short-term memory. And then finally, there's also your working memory. And your working memory is like where your thinking happens. And there is sort of this idea in programming that long-term memory doesn't really matter. People say things like, oh, programmers are people with good Googling skills, right? You don't have to know syntax. You can just look everything up. So we sort of downplay the influence of long-term memory a little bit. However, the more you know, the easier it is to process something. If you, you have to read um, text in Dutch, assuming you don't know Dutch, of course, then this is really hard for you because maybe every other word you have to look up. Some words are very similar and the, the grammar is similar. So you can do some guessing, but you, you have to look up many words and that makes it really hard and slow to read something, even though you are a proficient reader in another language. This is sort of the same for programming. If you're really familiar with a programming language 
or with specific programming constructs or a library or a domain, then it gets really easy to read code. But if you lack that understanding, then your long-term memory can really get in the way of your short-term memory. Because for you, remembering a few Dutch words will be really hard because you don't really know their meaning. So it's hard to store them in your memory. So that's really what the book talks about, about the influence of your long-term memory on how your short-term memory and working memory work. I, I, I work on the closure programming language in my day job. And so I spend a lot of time, I actually spend most of my time reading other people's code. Uh, a lot of time in particular reading <clears throat> modifications to existing code. So a lot, I read a lot of diffs and patches and things like that. Um, I don't know, I don't think that's actually covered explicitly in the book, but I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about, um, you know, things that might be different if you're like, what I find is I'm, I'm trying to recreate the mental model of the other of the person who wrote the change or the code and try to re walk the same path that they were walking. Um, which yeah, is hard, definitely. So <laughs> chapter six in the book actually talks about mental models. Okay. So it is very true that if you've written code, then you have a mental model. And this sometimes might even be the wrong mental model, but especially if code moves without you being there to do the moves, uh, then indeed it can be the case that you have certain assumptions that are no longer true, or that the, of course the person that reads the code makes assumptions based on those assumptions makes additions that later turn out not to be true. So mental models is a, a little bit further in the book. We definitely talk about what, what is a mental model? How do mental models transfer from one programming language to the other programming language or one concept to, other, to the other concept? And that is indeed definitely what's happening. If code is modified by someone else, then it might your mental model might be outdated and then it takes some time and energy of your working memory also to recreate that mental model. Mm -hmm. Uh, what, one thing I've been thinking about for a long time is like when you learn an inst to play an instrument or you learn to play a sport or something like that, um, we have lots of uh, ways to intentionally practice those things. Like we have uh, hundreds of years of tradition of how to, you know, intentionally practice those kinds of things. We don't, I feel like we don't really have that for programming. Like do, what, how do you intentionally practice code reading as a skill? Yeah, so that is very true. And this is also the argument I make in my book that indeed sports, music, all sorts of other fields, language, math, they, they really do deliberate practice. If you have a, a seven or an eight year old at home, how many times do they do the alphabet, right? How many times do they do small calculations under a hundred? Hundreds of times. So it's really true that we miss this skill of deliberate practice. And if we do deliberate practice, almost always the deliberate practice is programming, is writing. That's stuff like advent of code, which is nice, like nothing against advent of code, but it is producing code or people have, or like should have, right? Uh, a site Saturday open source project they're working on. Always the focus is if we practice, the, the practice is in writing. The assumption is that just writing more will make you a better programmer. Whereas as you say with music, yeah, that's not really true. If you play an instrument, you don't only play actual songs. You also play tone ladders and you do all sorts of finger practice on the guitar. So I describe a number of different exercises in the book to do deliberate practice. One of the things I do, what I, I propose that people do is actually syntax training with flashcards. So like you would tr train French, for example, you put an English word on one side, uh, like frog, and then on the other side, you put the word in French, and then you practice, you, you train yourself. This is something you can also do with programming language concepts and constructs. If you are entirely new, like I've never done closure in my life. So if I would want to learn that, then it would be great, a great way for me to learn is to put four state a for loop on one side in Python, which I know, and then the equivalent on the other side. So that is a way to get to know programming concepts so that the syntax doesn't get in the way. Because I think one of the mistakes that people make, especially if they transfer to a second programming language, is they think that they can be experts immediately. I, I would be super annoyed if I am very slow in making a for loop and in, in getting data from an endpoint or something, because this is an easy task. It should be an easy task. 
but you really need a little bit of syntax practice. So that is one of the deliberate practices that I described, but also for code reading, we have whole chapters on, the, on code reading with many specific exercises. For example, um, if you are new to a piece of code, you, you haven't seen it, or maybe you haven't seen it for a while, just look at the code for a few minutes and then you close your eyes or you close your laptop and you just throw down, okay, what, what, what are the things that occur to you? What is the first thing that occurred to you? What is the second thing that occurred to you? How are those things related? What did you notice in programming concepts? What did you notice in domain words, domain concepts? So that is a way to reflect on code. And again, this isn't just stuff I am making up. There's a very long history that we also describe in the book about research into natural language reading. If you have a, a teenager in high school, very often they would do these exercises, right? They get a story or a newspaper article and they have to read it for five minutes and then they have to put it away and have to write down, okay, what did you remember? What was this story about? What is the main character? Those are exercises of which we know that they really support normal text, natural language text comprehension. Um, so it's extremely likely that this is also going to support programming comprehension. So uh, in your keynote that you did at Strange Loop in 2019, one of the things I thought was really fascinating was um, the part about vocalizing uh, syntax and, and saying, pr practicing saying syntax out loud as you're learning and how important that is, just like it is with natural language. Um, and uh, that was something I don't think I've ever heard anything about before. And it, uh, so I, that was one of my favorite parts of the talk. Um, and I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about, about that. Yeah, absolutely. So a part of the memory that we haven't described now in this chat, but it is described in the book, is called the auditorio, auditory memory. So if you hear something, it enters a specific part of your memory. Actually, all your senses have their own little, little mini story. So there's also visual memory that if you look at something and you close your eyes, then you can still see it in a sense. So that is your, uh, your visual memory. And there's also auditory memory. Um, an example of this is suppose someone, this is a bit old fashioned example, but someone calls you on the phone and tells you a, a number, a postal code or something, a zip code or uh, a GUID of uh, um, a database element that is corrupt or something, and you don't have anything to write on. So you have to remember 547A, B, 12 or something. What you would do is you would rem rem remind yourself in, a, in your silent voice, right? You put down the phone, you were looking for a pen, and you go like 45A, B, 12, 45A, B, 12. So that is your auditory memory. And we know from research that the way words sound, what happens in your auditory memory, also very much influences what happens in your, in your thinking part. For example, the example that I gave uh, in the talk at Strange Loop is if you have people read a sentence in which a word sounds ambiguous. For example, if you have the sentence, I have a tear, and then the next part is in my pants. And what happens is if you're reading it, you were like, oh, that wasn't tear, that was there. You have to go back and re-pronounce the word in the correct, correct way. We did some experiments based on, again, based on science that was already there in other fields. We did some experiments in which we had children vocalize Python code. So we just had them read it aloud. We said, just imagine you have to do this homework on the phone and you're telling your friend that they have to type up the code. And we saw very interesting patterns where kids don't know how to vocalize characters. If, if it's an equal sign or in Python, you have equal, equal. They wouldn't specifically read equal, equal. It's sort of a weird way to read. So they would just skip it. And of course, if you don't read it in your inner voice, if in your inner voice you read, if I is five, instead of if I is, is five, Later on, if you're typing, then you might also not use this inner voice to remind yourself that you actually have to type two consecutive equal signs because otherwise the code doesn't work. So this vocalization, this inner voice that you use is, is very important in programming. And what we also found is, as you are also saying, no one has thought about it, this before, as far as we could. Uh, we really dove into existing science. And it doesn't seem to be the case that other people have ever explored this idea of 
what do people hear if they hear code? And it's also super inconsistent. So we just had some studies in which we asked professionals to read some Python code aloud, and then they're super not systematic about it. So sometimes they would say, um, and if you have I plus is one, for example, they would say adds one or uh, increase by one or add one to the value. So they're very in, not systematic, which probably isn't a problem if you're already an expert, but imagine I would go to closure and I don't even know how to properly inner voice all the weird characters that I don't know, then that just takes up extra energy. So it would be great if people, communities get a sort of a, like a standard saying, this is how we call those things. Like in, in Python, you now have this new operator, the uh, colon is, and they call this thing the walrus operator, right? Because it looks like a walrus because it has teeth. Firstly, I, we have no walruses here in this country. So I didn't even know why it was called a walrus operator. Uh, and so it's not very inclusive of people that don't have walruses. Uh, but also it helps me in no way to understand what it does. Am I gonna say X walrus five? That's just a very badly chosen name. Yeah, I think about with with closure as a lisp, it's all you know, parenthesized, nested parenthesized expressions, yeah. and I have no idea how to read that in a way that is useful to people. So I have thought about it some. I haven't come up with an answer yet, but I'm I'm still thinking about it. Um, yeah, brackets were actually in the experiments we did. Brackets were really interesting. Br uh -huh. Round brackets or parentheses, because some people would indeed say if they're defining a function, uh, f takes integer. So they would really translate it to the meaning if it's a function definition. And then in function application, people would say f of five. So that's a, that's a great way actually yeah. to vocalize parentheses uh, in, in actually what they mean. But yeah, if it's really a, an AST in a lisp, then yeah, how do you read it? I wouldn't know either. Um, uh, another thing you, you said in your talk was um, you were talking about uh, wanting to start a, start a pedagogical pedagogical fight about um, whole language versus phonics type things like exp explicit instruction versus immersion, and this is something that I uh, really connected with because my wife runs a dyslexia reading center and and we have a dyslexic child and um, and we, I I hear her doing phonic instruction all day long on the <laughs> on the computer so I am we are one hundred percent fully on board with. Uh, Phonic and explicit instruction, because that's the only way that uh, is really useful for dyslexic kids to learn how to read. So I'm wondering if you, if you, how, how how's it going? How's the uh, picking a fight going? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I think in a sense, my book is also a continuation of that fight, because, for example, like the flashcards training syntax, uh, I say, well, that works if you're an adult learning in a second programming language. Clearly, that also works if you're a child learning a first programming language. So the book isn't really meant for educators, but many people, of course, in the programming community are also programming educators to their own kids or to the school that kids go to or in coder dojos or programming clubs. Just because there, there aren't so many teachers, regular teachers that know programming, many of the programming education also falls on the shoulders of our community. So part of the fight is also, I think, in the, sprinkled in the book in some ideas that might work for you, they also might work for your children. And also something else that's maybe pretty interesting to talk about is I made a programming language. So I made a programming language called HediCode, HediCode.com. Um, and that programming language is also an implementation of the ideas that I talked about already in 2019 at Strange Loop. So the idea of Hedy is that it does teach programming like it teaches, like we teach a natural language. Rather than teaching everything of Python at once, we teach Python in steps. We call this a gradual programming language. It's a little bit like gradual typing, but then the syntax is gradual rather than the types. So Hedy has levels, and in the first level, you can just you have like no syntax. You just say Python, oh sorry, print, and then you know, hello world. No brackets and no quotation marks. So kids get used to this is programming and this is why it's fun you can already at level one build a, a tiny interactive story without any syntax and then in the next step we say okay but if you have no brackets no, no quotation marks it's kind of hard for the computer to know what is a variable and what is text 
So look, we run into issues in this programming language because we don't have quotation marks. We cannot tell the computer when we mean the string, a string, and when we mean a variable name that we want to have. And we, as an example, we define name as a variable, and then that's nice because then you can use it in your interactive story. But then if you want to print my name is name, then you have to tell the computer that the first name is a string and the second name is a variable. And so then gradually every level adds a little bit of syntax, in addition to also explaining why this syntax is useful. And I think Hedy is very much an implementation of this idea of phonics, because if you teach a natural language, again, if you have a five-year-old, then you also don't say, okay, five-year-olds are gonna learn how to read. Here are all the rules, semicolons, quotations, exclamation marks, all the rules and uh, sentences and sub sentences. Uh, no, you're just happy if they can do a three word sentence. It doesn't need to start with a capital letter. It's just, it's, it's fine. So in that same line of thinking, we, we created Hedy Code, which is free and open source, by the way. So people can just try it out for free. And it's not like I'm selling anything apart from the book, of course. <laughs> and, and, and that is very much this phonics implemented in a programming language. That's really interesting. I, I did look at it a little bit before the, before we got on. So it, 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 it is really interesting. Um, I also wanted to ask you about back in uh, 2014, you did a talk at Strangeloop about uh, spreadsheets and um, your, your love of them and your belief that they are programming. <laughs> and I'm fully on board with that. Do you, do you still work on spreadsheets on a regular basis or is it more? No, no. I have a few grad students who are still finishing their thesis work like in my, in my, in my old line of research. So I'm still supervising a few students that work on that. Uh, but my own main research interest now is programming education. Although I do think there are lots of parallels between people that are programming in spreadsheets and, and kids in a sense. One thing that I really still take away from my work on spreadsheets into my work on programming for kids is the idea that if you're an accountant, you are not interested in programming you're interested in getting your budget to be right or getting your model to work. You don't care about programming at all. It is a tool. And I think so much of our community is built upon the idea that if you wanna be a programmer, you have to love programming and, and not the goal, but you have to love the tool. Like if you say something like, well, I don't really care for programming. I care for making something with programming, then, you're sort of out group, right? That's, that's not the proper opinion in a sense. And that is also true if you teach kids, some kids will really like programming, but some kids, you have to tell them why it's fun. And this is also just coming back to Hedy a little bit. Some of the introduction material I've seen for kids just assumes kids want to learn programming, probably because it's written by adults that love programming, which isn't a bad thing in a sense, but if the first 10 pages of your book are setting up a virtual environment in Python, and then the next 10 pages are, yeah, you have to use brackets and quotation marks, and you have to put space in the right place. You're only going to make that as a kid. You're only going to be willing to invest in all of this if you're really certain that this is going anywhere. So if you're the type of kid that maybe doesn't have a computer at home, doesn't know what can be achieved with programming, or if you're a girl and many people in your younger years have told you that programming is hard and it's really for you and it's really more for your brother, then maybe after your first few disappointments, you're like, yeah, this isn't for me or why, why would I care? And I think I really still, when I'm teaching programming, I really do think of people in an accounting department that are, they don't love, I mean, I love formulas in Excel. I think they're a work of beauty, but those people in there, they're, it isn't like, look at this formula and look how beautiful it is. No, it's just, now it works. I'm happy, moving on. And, and you have to make sure if you're teaching kids that you have enough of those moments where they make something, they're like, oh, right? I know Sam Aaron also did a talk at Strange Loop. And one of the things I really like with the programming language that he made, Sonic Pi, this is a, a language with which you can create music. And, and his philosophy is that if kids go to a concert and they see someone like Bob Dylan with a guitar or with a piano, then that's the tool they can also have at home. 
they can also buy a guitar and start to play it. So you want to have this thing that feels real, that feels like, like the real thing. And I think that's a, that's a great philosophy. Kids don't want to learn the guitar because they like the, the thing, right? They like the music it makes. And maybe they like the music they see some people in bands. Like, oh, this, that's what I want to learn. And then doing all the stupid tone ladders that's boring, right? That's not, that's not fun. It's just not fun to do. But it's so clear to them what they can be, what they can do, what they can achieve if they learn the guitar that they are willing to put in the pain. And I think that's, that's something as a programming community we're not great at yet to explain kids like what they can do, all these examples. And I am so guilty of this as well. But so many of my examples also in university, I mean, hello undergrads, you know what we're gonna do? Print all the prime numbers. <laughs> like, in retrospect, I now know that this isn't fun for everyone. I think it's really cool, but why, why care about that? Especially if you're in a, in a broad, undergrad program and like a liberal, liberal arts program, why do you want to print all prime numbers? There are infinitely many, like who, who cares? So I'm really also in my university teaching trying to turn that around into, oh, here's a piece of Shakespeare. I'm going to analyze what type of words they use and how different is Shakespeare from today's newspaper, which you can also do that with, with two nested for loops. You can already do a little bit of interesting text analysis. And then so, some undergrads might think, oh, like this is a useful tool. So if I want to become a linguist, if I want to do analysis of written texts, then Python makes sense to learn a little bit more about. And it's such a more inclusive way to do stuff. Yep, I, I've tried, uh, well, I've worked with kids a number of times and trying to teach different things. And I always try to start with something uh, something that they might want to do, <laughs> like, you know, pro you know, drawing things on the screen or uh, writing interactive fiction or, uh, you know, to tell a story or uh, making music, uh, you know, those are all yeah. things I've, I've used to, to get started in that. Um, and that, that definitely seems to work better if you connect, start from that. And then, and then the other thing is the, the sort of the feedback cycle, you know, being able to do something and see the result of it um, quickly at the beginning seems like a, a key aspect of, of, you know, getting that little, you know, endorphin hit <laughs> from yeah, you know, yeah, change absolutely. something and see a result, you know, so. All right. Well, that's all I had today. Is there anything else you want to talk about with the book or um, do you know when it's going to be done or? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yes. It's, I, I have to send it to the printer uh, mid-April. So that is in six weeks. I'm mainly saying that as a reminder to me that I have to finish it. But the, there are 12 out of the 13 chapters have been written. So they will slowly be added to the online book. So if people buy the online book now, there are now four chapters out. But every three, four weeks, a new chapter will be released on the in the early access program. And then it should be coming out print somewhere in May. Excellent. Well, I look forward to reading the rest of it. I've only been able to see the first few chapters of it, but uh, so far I, I thought it was fascinating. It's, uh, I, would, I would definitely recommend it. Thank you so much for, um, for chatting today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks, bye.